There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to Interverse again. Excited to have everybody with us for conversation I've been looking forward to for quite a long time with a great new friend of mine, internet friend named Jock Hagstrom. Actually, his name is pronounced Yua Kim, but for us English speakers, he just lets us call him Jock. Makes it a little easier on us. But one of the things that he and I have been bonding over lately, well, amongst many things, is a shared interest in etymology and how the root languages of Finnish and the Norwegian north northern parts of Europe have a lot of connection to the words we use in English and how we can start to understand mythology, the secret elements of history, and just exactly what it is that we're doing here on Earth by taking apart the language and getting to the the root words and the root sounds and picking those apart. So that's going to be a big component of the conversation today. And we're also planning on talking about sound and frequency just as a base concept to understanding reality as well. Of course, that connects to language, how sounds correlate to everything from colors to emotions to shapes, and probably a lot of other occult history and mythology things that might creep into this conversation. We'll see where we go. Pretty excited about it, though. We have a lot of fun when we've been chatting on the Interverse Discord channel. I first heard Jock on Unslaved Podcast, which some of you guys are probably members of because you might have found Interverse from me being on Unslaved. So you probably are already familiar with Jock. He also is a big researcher of what's called the Box Saga, which is an amazing and deep and weird and fascinating oral history give, handed down by uh, handed down to us by a guy named Eeyore Bach who seems to have received this uh, knowledge of the secrets of our history that have been mostly destroyed by organizations like the Vatican. He received it from his family and might have been the last one to get the transmission. So that's a really, really interesting other side subject that I think we're going to tackle in plus a little bit. So uh, yeah, let's get this party started. Really excited to have you here, Jock. Always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. Welcome to Interverse. (laughs) Well, thank you, Shaz. This is a nice opportunity and nice to talk to you. You know, we have only been chatting a little bit by vocals, but this is going to be fun to see. Spin your brain on stuff, too. Yeah, I think this is going to be one of those back and forth conversations rather than uh, question and answer conversations. But I'm, I'm interested in starting with any of the stuff that I just talked about. I would love to hear more about you as a person and what you're into. I know that you are a musician and so sound is a a big part of your life. And that of course connects into language as well. The fact that you're a singer. So tell us about who you are, the kind of art that you create and uh, what gets you excited about life. Well, uh, you know, I've always been interested in in, uh, art, both in music and, you know, painting, but I actually started out more as a painter and, uh, been working a lot about on geometry and, you know, trying to make stuff that is based on, you know, uh, like the flower of life geometries and, and all that. That's sort of where I began my, because I could start to see correlations within the, with those artistic elements, like in nature and time. And, you know, the clock is also, you know, you see this everywhere when you start to see it you know, this, this underlying structure and it seems to be some kind of law in nature. But, uh, in my, in the, like when I was like 16 or 17, I started to play a lot of music too, besides like painting. And uh, when I started to make lyrics, most of this, when I had to put stuff on paper, because I'm not a, I'm not a reader or, or writer. 
there very much, you know, at least when I was, uh, was uh, a youngster, you know, I was kind of terrible at school, but I was really good at certain things like uh, art and ma- some ge- geometric, uh, geometry, we call it, uh, you know, this kind of mathematics, but all the kind of mathematics I just, you know, fail. But those more expression things was my interest, you know, and history too. So that's, that's like how I started out all this with this artistic and musical lens. But then when I grew into like twenties and you started to work and you started to see stuff in society, you start to question a lot of things. So it's very emotional driven my, my journey because I've been so frustrated, you know, almost at the point where you just want to throw in the towel and just live in the, in a cabin or anything. But I'm, I'm been living in the, in the city core here in a small town in Sweden for about 10 years because most of the musicians you find here too. So, and I've been quite a, a figure here because I've been playing live on stages and, you know, the, we were really pumping up there when we, in my early twenties, you know, we, we did a lot of gigs and play death metal music, you know, just people just stood there. What the fuck is that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I think it's amazing. You know, I had a good life so far, but all this essentially led to history. You know, we started to question your roots and because there's something in there. When I started to become more interested in the structure of music and I found out that this 22 string instrument, uh, the sitar, you know, it's based on the 22 alpha, uh, letters in the Hebrew alphabet also. Really? And that, yeah. So I thought like, Hmm, okay. Uh, and I saw the rune stones and they, they had some kind of books there about the rune stones, especially one rune stone called the Kilvert stone with her, which had like 24 marks. And they had made like similar meanings to this Hebrew correlation. So I started to wonder, you, you can see there how, how, <laughs> how via this sitar, I went into this because it's also like a uh, higher, you know, a mark has a meaning. That's like the point, like hieroglyphs also. It's like a mark and it has a meaning, a story behind it. But I found out very quickly that uh, the research made on those rune stones and what they found on the rune stones, the basing, everything is very speculative. You know, it's very, very speculative. I think they have used some kind of numerology, but you know, I'm not very sure. I was very skeptical because I started to research this, all this, you know, they have written books and books about this. And it's most speculations. I read all the books about like Norse mythology and it wasn't enough. You know, I was on my way to make my own book about it, but I had to like scramble everything when I heard this, uh, this your book talking, because, you know, as a Swedish, my, the, the, my, you know, mother tongue is, is what they call root in Finland, the root sinkiale, they call it Swedish language. So we like sing the root, but from there, I was like given this new system, you know, uh, or an old system, a new perspective on this Norse take that I already had been researching so well. So I, I didn't have much more. It was actually this Michael Tessarion from Unslayed who pointed me in this direction at the first place. So. He suits himself over this <laughs> coming back like now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's really interesting the fact that academic interpretations of mythology and even things like runestones, like you're talking about, or you could look at Egyptian hieroglyphics, for example. All those yeah. interpretations are founded on assumptions for the most part. <laughs> and which means that the whole academic take on things could be a house of cards that is actually mostly wrong or misleading on purpose could, could be. And for example, uh, the, the Egyptian hieroglyphics that, that Rosetta stone that they say is the key to it all. 
is is that actually verifiable? I don't, we don't know that for sure ourselves. I mean, there's lots of shenanigans. <clears throat> there's lots of potential for shenanigans, I mean. And where where I think the interesting key difference is with uh, the way mythology worked for old older peoples versus now is things weren't really written down in the same way. And that means that if you're passing something on from mouth to ear, the person who's telling the story can, of course they could twist it on their own if they wanted to, but if they had a real reverence for the tradition and it, and it was part of their spirituality, they probably wouldn't want to twist it. They would probably want to make sure that the person receiving the knowledge interpreted it the way it was meant and not interpreted it however they wanted. And when we look at scriptures, when we look at mythology, all the writings on these things today, it's like one verse out of the Bible has 50 different interpretations depending on who you ask. And I think that's kind of the downside of this written history thing. Whereas because the, the, uh, the text becomes the history, whereas the, the oral tradition is a living thing. It's literally a vibration that originated at the source of when the events happened and then vibrated through the mouth to the ear, through another mouth to another ear and was alive and flowed in that sense. And yeah, they can make sure that the person they're telling got it the right way and it wasn't uh, made into something else. So, I mean, I'm not saying we should throw out all writing, but we have to question those things. And I didn't know that the sitar was based on the 22. I think it's really fascinating that the Hebrew alphabet, the, the rune stones, all these things have number associated with it. You're talking about being interested in geometry uh, but not the other kinds of mathematics, but geometry is the, I mean, you know, algebra and all that is very abstract and it requires this whole zero concept and the base 10 mathematics, which this is a whole nother subject, but I'm not even fully convinced that base 10 is the right way to do things or that zero is even worthwhile as a concept. <laughs> well, it's very, you, it's very visual mathematics. You know, I think that was attracted me. It's, it's very, Fictional, you can, you know, when you start to get these mathematics where you're just typing numbers in the machine and you get an answer, I don't know, and you make those graphs and everything, that's not my kind of thing. But I wanted to point out about this with the oral tradition or when you pass down history. This system of oral, it makes persons very important, you know, in society and so. So it's when we start to write stuff down too much, you don't need the human being almost. And then telling someone. So I think that's what you're talking about. It becomes very much alive, but it, it, it's so much more than that too. It kind of connects people also, you know, it's a very natural thing because it's, we have been doing that longer than we have been writing. So much, much longer, if you ask me, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's also about the perspective, you know, when you talk about mythology, what perspective you look at things, the statues, and because they ha use statues and, and glyphs, like glyphs or a rune stone, or a, but they were special people that actually interpreted this. It's a, you could say like a priest class, but it wasn't really like that, more like a, a job, you know. There's, there's the guy who inter interpreted the runes. So, you know, it could be a magical it. thing too. The with rune stones, there's a lot of magic and divination associated with with rune stones. I mean, you're, we talked a little bit about geometry a second ago. That's how shapes appear in nature. But when you combine the organic aspect of numbers or numerology with written languages, the way that the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical correlation to it. I just did a whole episode recently about gematria, and that's the geometry, the geometry of language. Yeah, the geo. So it's, the, it's the store of earth, too. The geo. I say you divide it in three, the three, geoma, geometry. We say geometry. Three is three. So, you know, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> you have this. I've never thought about that. And tree is also tree. You yes. Know? But if you think about it this way, if someone writes a book about you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers. Then the reader, as he goes and reads, he can never really, of course he can, but it's very easy to get the logic out. You know, you don't get the, the person to think too much. 
But if you have like a, a, a room system where you share information via a glyph or then you need associations by yourself so you can sit there and figure, you know, so it becomes, you know, you can like put in a little bit of fantasy in books and over time, you know, people can just spin out of control in their logic, you know, because it's the logic that the, they want, you know, is the heathen or the more, you know, the early man, they thought, I, I can see them very much despising this writing with books and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of it too. I rather listen to like when someone read a book for me. <laughs> I like podcasts a lot too, because they're kind of yeah. like the oral tradition coming back. We're having conversations exactly. about things. It's a living thing. I'm not against books all the way. I mean, no, I, have me huge, either. I have a huge stack of books that I'm working on right now. I've really been happy actually getting into reading more deeply than I was for a while. I almost feel like the uh, younger kid version of myself because when I was a kid, I would be reading constantly in all my free time. And I have been kind of returning to that way of being. But, you know, it's it depends on what you're reading as well. Whenever we're talking about something maybe a little more scientific or research-based nonfiction... Sometimes the books are really great for that. But back to the mm. mythology question, a lot of what we read about mythology or history is not the original source material. It's what somebody is telling you about what somebody else wrote or what somebody else said. And not that we can't go back and find what is supposed to be the source material, but it it just becomes like, it becomes a different kind of thing for sure. Uh, it's it's less directly you connected to the source of that. and. Yeah, I mean, I love audiobooks and I love podcasts for this exact reason that we can figure out what it really means by going in de depth about just zooming in on one thing. Whereas in a book, you might just get one sentence about something. And I don't know, there's there's positive and negative to the, yes, the written language course. for sure. But it all it all comes back to the intentions of the people that are setting things up, writing the things and <laughs> in charge of the society, basically. Well, it's also I'm thinking about when you when you put uh, letters on, on on paper like that, you can start to you can turn like an a letter E or you say E, but you, we say A. You can like turn that into another letter if you start to change them. And I have seen that with older books when you buy like an older Bible, they swap the letters, you know. So maybe. An R is something else, you know, over time, you know, we, so we can start to lose the association. And in this, in the, in this, uh, mythology, I've been researching the most, the Finnish one. This is really, really important that you get the, the, the letters right or the sound is right. So what you're saying though is the, the I, letter I in English, like we have it, the line with the dot above it is actually E in. No, you side. say like E. Or what if you take the a you know the the a sound uh, well, i i heard like they pitch it up like to e e e it's a very close to e right a and e but <laughs> like in uh, Euro europe e you e europe you don't you say europa e europa so it's you see so maybe two or three sounds become like only one letter at the end as a one sound that if you another good example is like yeah, I don't know but it's uh, Earl Earl there you have a sound you know the, the sound Earl yeah you have this Ö or Ö that's actually a letter in, in Swedish that we have a, a letter for that sound the Earl because you don't write Earl, you don't have like a, you see, like one E, or you say E, 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 E. <laughs> it's very strange when, when I start to do, do this. But the, And Ur is like related to Earth also, that sound yeah. Ur. And we kind of lose those meanings in English a lot of the time. We take things to be just the definition that we're all accustomed to using. We don't think about the components. You're right, completely different. Mean. 
And like in the runes and in ancient Hebrew, the letters themselves, the sound of that letter was also a word. The letter itself had a meaning in and of itself, which is interesting. And then we're talking about vowels here. I also have to point out that if sound creates the reality, if we speak our world into being, if that's how the, if that's what the logos is, then having completely different vowel sounds for the same word from one language to another, even though we're trying to say the same thing kind of throws us off, right? Like the vowels themselves are kind of a sacred thing. There's only a few sounds that work the way vowels work, if that makes sense. Um, and yeah. some people actually use the vowel sounds as a way of intoning positive frequencies in, into their body and into their consciousness. Like just, spending time in a meditative state, just going, ah, yep. e, eh, and that's like a real thing. <laughs> it's a, yeah. it's, it's a real thing. And uh, we, we lose that a little bit in translation from, from root to English and, and back and forth. There's actually, with my understanding or through the alphabet we use up here, there are nev- uh, nine clear sounds, like, n- but all the other sounds are combinations with those nine clear sounds. And when I see the mythology there, they say there are like nine realms of the Yggdrasil tree. I think like, hmm, maybe it is those nine sounds that are the basis. And there's you know, nine numbers. There's only nine digits. Yeah, exactly. If you don't count zero because zero is not really real. <laughs> yeah, it's just a spin, spin around, I guess. The zero, the circle. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know, but this is not very interesting. interesting. It's it's uh, zero is nothingness, which doesn't actually exist in the reality, and I think it should represent a uh, wholeness, not nothingness, if that makes sense. Well, I'm thinking that the zero is very much as the letter, the U. They are the same mark, you know. Maybe, maybe it's that that is the thing, you know. It's not even a, a number because we you, you see what I'm saying. Yeah, and then what's interesting too is one in English begins with the the zero or the circle, and the way we pronounce one, the beginning yeah. of the w sound is a w sound, which you could interpret as being double u, like one oneness or the zero that totality symbol actually equals double u or two. It's kind of a weird occult type of mathematics you could say but you could you could write it as like zero or o equals two because that that first digit which is that symbol the it sounds like one and it's a double u and what the reality is is you and the the you inside and the you outside the external world and the internal world which are just like mere reflections of each other I hope that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very interesting. You know, this double view, double view. We don't really have that in Swedish. That's something. Uh, but can you separate like a, a, a regular V with a double? Or in the English, I'm, I'm asking you if there's like a two different sounds for it. Uh, it's, this is the strangest. It's like... You know, it's a weird letter, dude. That yeah, because it's called W, but it's not the same as a regular U. No, it's it's the it's the, it's so off if you really think about it, because you don't say double. It's, it doesn't have an attached uh, sound. You don't, you know you say double B, double B. You say yeah, I I don't know it, but I, we don't include it in my brain. I don't include that. I don't do in in the alphabet. It's really interesting, man. Yeah, <laughs> d- never thought about that. W is kind of a a unique thing to English. That letter and yeah. the way they do the sound, like. But you guys will kind of do that sound in other places a little bit. That well, we don't necessarily use it like. Um, but th- that's what I'm asking you. If you have a v. sound for it, yeah, we say but v v. It's just a v. It's the end of this ring. You know, it's it's. We have uh, 22 letters in a ring and uh, we have uh, actually uh, there are 29 sounds total 
I think it's 21 or 22. Is it? Or I, I actually have to count. And then in numerology, 22 is like the master builder number. 22 yeah, is a super big deal to 1111. Yeah, it's the... But I, what I think is interesting with the, the sound system I have been learning is that you have those 22 sounds in a ring and you have, I think it's seven outside standing still. You know, those are like stand standoffs, like O, A, and O. Th those sounds are not in this spinner rack, you know, and it, it has a story by itself, but the Yggdrasil, the E, it stands for Yggdrasil. For example, those are other, you know, it, it, they are not so much related to those other sounds. But it's interesting. I can imagine why people skip them out, actually. But in, in my language, I use them quite a lot. Now, I really love the concept of Yggdrasil. World trees and cosmic eggs, those type of mythological stories which are found everywhere. I'm endlessly fascinated by that and why they're so similar from place to place. Even when you have in Greece, there's the cosmic egg that's surrounded by the Orphic serpent. And then Yggdrasil has the world yeah. serpent around it. And there's this concept of like the, the entire universe being encapsulated in this living system or living structure. And then there's this like sort of evil serpent that is surrounding it and trying to consume it or take the life force out of it in a way or destroy it and i just find that really interesting especially too with how the 22 letters of these ancient languages got turned into 26 letters for english and how 26 is supposed to be the number of god in uh like yahweh is supposed to equal 26 and like where is this some kind of construct that was built to replace something that was before it and uh sort of usurp its power or take the power from nature and create an artificial system to put people in this sort of slavery matrix of uh, <laughs> modern times. Like yeah. these are deep questions. Well, I have to point out there are actually 29 sounds in this, uh, this Nordic. Story. Oh, in, uh, in alpha, root there yeah. are. Yeah. But uh, it's very interesting. You know, when we look back and see all those mythologies, you know, and we have, I, I actually sat, sat and uh, took a look at this today, you know, over the Greek side there. They have this pantheon, you know, there's like big families and they went there and they been with that God and here and there. But it's really interesting because you can see in the names, you know, of course they have been written down. But when I sit there and look, you know, you, you get another, if you start to break down the words or the sounds of the, of the actual names, you can get like another story, you know, but then you have to, but that's only from the lens of this Venemoinen, because that gives like this toolkit to start to decode sound. But the problem is when you have everything written down, maybe you get it a little bit wrong, you know, so you can confuse yourself. So it is, <laughs> but it's a lifelong, lifelong study, this subject actually. That I've now, been hooked into. It's like the end of the road for me because all of this studying with music and scales and, you know, sound and try to find it and that, you know, it's like the end of the road has been this, this door that I opened with this archive that come from the north. It's really interesting because you start to look at history in all different kinds of ways too. Which we have to do. And what you're thinking or what you're talking about made me think of something we were discussing on our Interverse Discord, which you've been a really great member of. What I super appreciate that. In fact, you're one of the people that helped get it kicked off. And the fact that you were active and participating drew interest from the new people as they joined. And now it's fairly active and really fun. So I hope listeners that it's want really to fun. join in will get in there. And there's quite a few topics that we might want to talk about that have come up in the Discord. But one of them that sort of relates to this also to the Greek pantheon in a way is the Emerald tablets. Of yeah. Thoth or that's super, I'm on that. So, uh, you know, I've been, you know, I go back there once in a while because, you know, when I was in my early twenties, when I really started, I, I found out the first thing I really found out that I studied hard was this Emerald tablets of Thoth. 
And I listened to like an audio book on it. Oh, probably 200 times just because there was something there, you know, but now like almost 10 years later, this has been like creeping up because it's so embedded into my brain, this story, you know, but it's probably the, the biggest description description of Atlantis there is because this guy Hermes, he comes from Atlantis. Well, give, in, give the audience a little bit of a description of the tablets in case. I mean, I bet a lot of people know what that is, but there's a few people that probably haven't heard of the Emerald tablets. So hmm. let's kind of give a history and a summary of what they contain. And then, yeah, let's talk about this Atlantis thing. And <laughs> I'm sure that's going to tie in a lot to the, the box stuff that we talk about in the second yeah. hour, too. Well, I, I have a hard time to turn that off because... As for now, most of my perspective goes through this uh, Veinemoinen lens that I have. I, I call it a lens. I just put on like a Google, pair of Googles, you know, and <laughs> because I have it in my brain. But anyway, those texts are really, you know, it's strange. I try to find the origins of this, but it said like the first translations of whatever the tablets are, you know, we don't know where they are, these uh, or actual tablets. I don't think uh, the earliest description or translations are like from the 1800s. Some uh, in some Muslims had it, I think. But they would have been finding it in Turkey, I think, underneath a statue of Hermes. There was like a cave underneath or something. It's like a legend, but I thought it was funny. But anyway. Those tablets are, I think it's like 24 tablets or something like that. They are too supplementary. I'm not sure if this, if it's the same writer, or, you know, they have been translating this over and over. So you don't, you're not really sure. I think even Isaac Newton made like a, his own translation of it too. How about, it's not very long. So just for fun, how about I read this Newton translation? It's not super long. I think there's more to it than that, but... That's not the one I, I've been uh, going... It's this... Uh, it's uh, If you search for Emerald Tablets translation, it should come up where there are like 22 or 24 tablets. But yeah, there's really just in Latin. one that most people know yeah. about. There's just one little like poetic short thing that most people read and they're like, oh, that's the Emerald Tablets. But as you're saying, it's a lot more than that. Yeah, there's other translation, but you know, you, if you start to read it, it's it's very strange. A lot of things there, you know it. You know it's it's substantial. You know, I vibrated to this. You know, I got those boost my shields. You know, I started to get this all the time when I heard it the first times, because I think the first tablet, uh, it talks about. Atlantis and the destruction of Atlantis and he talked about you know this great civilization or people living there and there was this big temple or this uh, holy temple and uh, he got this mission to get out of there and I think he, he went to the men of Kem, this Hermes guy but he came from Atlantis and uh, he wanted to give the story. Is Egypt I've, yeah, I, I, I'm very sure about that. So maybe this is where we get a lot of the Egyptian, you know, this kind of culture down there. Because they made, you know, the essential figure in this Veinemann mythology is this, uh, this Bok, the goat head. And if you go to Egypt, you can see a lot of stage statues of, of goats, goat heads, you know. Even on the statues, the, the goat is bigger than the than the actual ruler down there. So it's very interesting that they put the goat head above and they put the figure between the statue of the current ruler or uh, a great person down there. They always had the goat head on top. <laughs> yeah, it is odd. And that ties into so many things from like the more modern Baphomet concept to even just words like God. God sounds kind of like goat or got, and yeah. there's seems to be a linguistic connection there too. That, uh, but why? <laughs> why? Why do we have? Yeah, you have another evidence in the Bible, you know, because you know this is the worst 
they they like to write bad stuff about their enemies, you know. And uh, this uh, Catholic and Orthodox it crept up from from the so southern. If you go to the Vatican today, you can see it standing there on the wall, like the, all evil come from the north, and it's right there in on the Vatican wall. You know, they really? have this they have this room with with all the winds, the northern winds, the eastern winds. You know, they had these chambers and they write stuff there and have pictures of the people living in the different regions. You know. So they can control and keep everyone in shake, I guess. <laughs> it's really interesting. It is really interesting. And like different ways of even looking at the planet. Uh, so I, I like to admit that I'm earth shape agnostic, which can annoy some people, but I, I entertain whatever could possibly be plausible without this, because I haven't actually like, you know, gone way up in the sky and looked down and seen the whole thing <laughs> but the, you tend to see it when you fly i guess you know if you fly i've been flying to like thailand from here and you fly very high up and you can see like a curve definitely i i don't know but the what's interesting about it on a mythological <laughs> on a mythological level is the fact that in the cosmic egg or the more sort of like pseudo flat earth concepts or world tree concepts the north is like the spine of the world it's like the very middle or like the where the chakras are, if that makes sense, like the chakras yeah, yeah. of the planet on a as above, so below level. So even if that's just like a spiritual metaphor, that's very interesting to consider that the Vatican is saying all evil comes from there when some more paganistic or what they would call heathen ways of looking at the world considered that part of the world to be like the core or the the source area where the the energy from God or the cosmos is like, a column that radiates out from that middle point. And so I just find that interesting as a concept. Yeah. But you have to, if you see it like this, the world tree is also like the axis of the planet where the, where it spins around. That's a good and, point. And it, and it's called Yggdrasil. Also draw a seal, draw is pulling in root. Also you pull something like a tree, it pulls in the, and converts it to, of air, you know, it pulls in something and releases something. And I think that's why they go with this concept that it's a world tree, because it's kind of pulls in like a, a magnetic field does. If you see the axis, it goes in and, you know, it's like a one um, force, you know. So if you think about where the because it rotates around its own axle and you have this pulling effect, like a tree pulls in. I think that's become very natural to depict something like that. You can like, like have a disc that is spinning, but you know, you can have like, you can, you can describe this on so many levels if you really think about it. And I think uh, previous man, they really wanted to embody the loss of, uh, nature, you know, so embodied that in on every plane as good as possible. And the, when you start to make um, concepts like Yggdrasil and stuff like that, it's it requires a lot of more of the you know the worldview picture to really grasp what the, what it means. You know, that's why maybe we get so we don't get much information about. The mythology, for obvious reason that it's the storytellers has been wiped out. So we don't. But when I yeah, think about the very logical, written down by the monks, like the Vatican monks are the ones who gave us their version of the stories that we do get uh, from the ancient mythology. Yeah, but this in this uh, main and minor story, it's, uh, actually this uh, this uh, area in Finland is where the planet stood when it, if you think that it's tilted now for it's obviously tilted because we're winter and stuff. But if you, if you just think that it stood right straight up, then that point would be in Finland. So everything would rotate around that, you know, and that's when what it would be like a eternal spring, right? The idea yeah. that before there was a tilt, some cataclysm caused the tilt, but before that it was like never really all the way dark and never really getting, that cold is that right 
Exactly. Well, in this story, they said that the entire planet was tropical, like 50 million years ago before the Ice Age. And then this Ragnarok got it to tilt over. So that's like because, the Golden Age. Yeah, you could say that. In this tablet, they say the children of light lived in Atlantis. And on the rest of the planet is the children of men. <laughs> I think it's interesting that they distinguish it that way because they were, if you, if people were living up here in that situation, they would only have light. I, mean, it, so. I have an interest that made me think of something really interesting. Like this may be a little off topic for you or for some people that might not have looked into this very much, but I've been, very fascinated in the difference between natural law and the law of man, basically. And one of the core ideas here is that the, the system of law we all live under, legalism or whatever, it all derives itself from the Vatican in every country in the world, actually. In their legal code, it all is coming back to, to Rome, essentially. And like the, the opposite of that is where you live under the laws of nature or God or light. Like those words could be synonymous, light, truth, God, nature, source, all one thing. So the children of light could very well be a way of saying humans that lived with no legalism, no slavery, so to speak. And it was just, they lived under natural law, the laws of karma, harmony and balance with nature, only doing things that nature would do permissible to nature. Whereas the children of men, you could be describing people that live under the system of legality. And the, ch the chief difference between the two systems is under the legal system created by man, you can get a license to do things that are illegal or unlawful in nature, like killing somebody. If you're a soldier, you've got license to kill people, you know, but that wouldn't have been the case under, under God's law, if you will, or under nature's law. That, that's a violation of karma or of the, the right to live of another person. So anyway, that's kind of a digression, but I'd never heard of that before that the Northerners were the children of light and the rest of the world were children of men. And I don't know that to me, that's a way of interpreting that. <laughs> well, this is uh, just what I read from this time, but you know, you could see that they were at least the people who lived up. If you have a situation where you have a planet and you have an axle where it's not tilted over like ours. Then in this situation, in our solar system, obviously we would have 24 hour sunlight on the Northern part. So in that situation, when we live there, it will be different from the rest of the, of the planet. And if those in, in, in this concept with the Yggdrasil pulling in, uh, they have this concept of, uh, almost like reincarnation also that the souls travel with this current to the North Pole Valhalla. They, you know, they call it Valhalla. It's like the halls of choosing. And you can see in this tablet's text, they talk about the halls of Amenti, which is very similar to, to this, uh, Veni Minen story, because they have also this, this realm of the underworld concept, you know, they're supposed to be, when it spins around like this, the planet is, has carved out like a hole where, where those people supposedly had made like a big temple out of where they store all, all these artifacts and so forth, statues and because they didn't melt statues down. You know, even in Greek, they have a lot of statues, but you know, this is like the, the culture. It seems to be driven to make statues and stuff, nice art. And, you know, this is the way more hedonistic people actually live. They made statues and tokens and, you know, a lot of the, the creators, you know. It makes you wonder too with, with Egypt and Greece, how it seems like, at least from our perspective, a lot of their culture and their high art and statue making almost just came out of nowhere. Like all of a sudden they're just doing mm -hmm. all this. Yeah, well, they have stories about, you know, this, I, I actually read that this, um, Zeus, he had like, a he had many, many children, you know, but yeah, you can see, 
Yeah, Zeus. So, it's okay. I guess, I you see, this is the problem when the, with the written. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, this uh, this girl Europa <laughs> was was a child of this Zeus, <laughs> and they went from uh, this uh, where the gods lived via boat down to Crete and made something there. I, you know. It's like they come from a far away place, like Olympics, they call it. But they uh, they call it the heavens also. But it's interesting because this concept of heaven doesn't need to be like out in the vac vacuum of space, you know, in this sense. Heaven could be, you know, on top. So, you know... If you have this perspective and look at mythology, as soon as they spoke, speak about heaven, just think about another place on earth or a specific place. The Northern people call it Midgård or Asgård. Yeah. The, the, the central place, Mid means middle and Gård is a garden, the middle garden. Midgård is where the As, As people lived, the Asagudar, Asagods. And it's very it's similar to the like pantheon. A fruit, like a fruit that comes off a tree. Yeah. Yes, that's very interesting. But <laughs> it's very similar with the Greek because the gods sit in Olympics up in heaven. You know, it's, it's very similar. I don't know too much about the Egyptian side there, but it's a, as I said, this is a, something you can do for a very long time just because you really need to sit down and think also and relate because you don't have much information. You just have the name and maybe some pictures or statues, you know, so it's very, I think it's very healthy. You know, it's, it's nice to study art, you know, look at statues and different. I actually been to Egypt two times. It changed my life. Yeah. I've been walking in this Karnak temple there. And I have to say, I, I never visit, visited the pyramids. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Two times I've been there, but they said it was too dangerous to go there when I was there. You know, we were like 600 kilometers away from the pyramid. So, you know, at that time it was only a couple of years before it became too unstable to even go there, you know. A few years later, there was some kind of massacre where I had been there, where they shot Taurus. In the yeah. valley, no, in the valley of death, I think it's called this. They found Tutankhamun's uh, grave there. Valley of Kings, is that what they call it? Yeah, yeah, Valley of Kings, yeah, yeah exactly. I've been there too. It was the hottest place I've been to. <laughs> I've been there in the video game Assassin's Creed, but not in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I've been walking there. And the, the Karnak Temple is a fascinating thing. You know, there's so much stuff that you get to, to look at there. All those gold sets. And I, it changed my life to go there to think of, you know, that people in the past made this. It's so grandiose. <laughs> the ancient art and the ancient statues can almost tell you more than what the historians can if you know how to look at it and reflect on it. Yeah. But we are not taught, you know, they actually had people, you could go in real trouble if you told about stuff when you were there, if you didn't have a license, you know. And I remember, like yeah, I remember. Like illegal? <laughs> that's really illegal. I remember, remember my guide, he was so uh, into this and he wanted to tell us about things, but, you know, he just talked a little bit on the bus and he explained that I cannot say a word out there because I could get in real trouble. <laughs> Well, that ought to tell you something about what's going on. <laughs> You're not yeah. even allowed to speak freely. That was a red flag for me too. I was, was I was kind. I was like 14, 14 years old. So, you know, quite remember that. But it's if you ever can go back there, I, I hope it, it's it's still there. I don't know the situation now, but certainly a, a cool thing to see. The other is. It's really terrible, if you ask me, with the deserts and all. <laughs> this place. Well, okay, so we've got roughly 10 minutes in the free hour left. And 
I know we have a lot more history and mythology stuff to cover in the second hour when we give a bit of summary on this box saga we've been hinting at. I want to save it for the second hour, though. Yeah. And I want to let people know they can... I, I, I guess you can kind of drop some sources for that, too, for people who are curious about it that may not check out the second hour or that do and want to do their own research. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit more about sound because um, this sound frequency creating reality thing, it fascinates me endlessly. And I'm curious what you think about stuff like tuning forks as a, mm. if, you, if you ever encountered that as like a healing modality, I, you've probably seen in the discord, but I've been sharing that I just read this book about tuning the human biofield and, it's a really, really interesting concept that you can take the physical vibration of tuning forks and use it to change the electromagnetic vibratory field of the person. And I mean, just like to give that, a, to give it a really brief summary, you have a left side and a right side, and then you have this column in the middle that is your chakras or the energy center of vortexes. And when you have trauma or stuck energy, stuck emotion, it can be hanging out on the left or the right side of the body in this field. And this, this book I've been reading by Eileen McCusick that you can find at biofieldtuning.com has got like an anatomy that she has figured out, a map of mm -hmm. where different types of emotional problems sit in the field of the person's body. And that you can actually like sort of scoop up that vibration and move it back to the middle using the vibration of tuning forks at the right frequencies. And, you know, tuning forks might not be your thing or whatever, but I know that uh, sound is a big deal to you and how it correlates to other things. So I wonder what you think about, about that as a concept. Well, I don't need a tuning fork because I have my, I have my guitar. Yeah, you <laughs> it's do like that this, the it's the same. You have it like to, it's not, you, you know, it vibrates your entire being even better almost, but it's a nice way to get the right tune you want, you know, to have a reference. I think that's the purpose of it from the first place. It's like a very simple, but it's nice. You have the sound there, but the guitar is basically the same thing if you ask me, but it's really interesting you to take this up because if you think about sounds, how you can, if you change it a little bit, down or up when you tune, you can get it like we say out of tune, but what is actually nice to hear, you know, what is, to, what is healthy to listen to? Because what I used to do, I used to just tune it one string and then you see, oh, this, this sounds nice because at some places, you know, it sounds off. I don't know if it's like a, I used to thing you are born with or because we used to actually tune it into 432 frequencies the R the R string and I often when I just tune it by hand I end up there anyway it's like in between but I've seen those studies when they take like a, a tone that is supposed to be that doesn't sound too good it change like structure of, for example, water. And this, if you think about the human body is like 60% water. So if you bombard it with this, <laughs> you know, it makes sense in, in one, in one brain that there can be some kind of destructive force about this too, instead of just in tuning, because if you're out of tune, you can get headaches and, you know, but this is very technical to talk about, I guess, but <laughs> it's mostly a feeling for me. What, what sounds good, you know, it sounds good. And I think that's go across the board, you know, I, I'm sure there's some kind of rule to it, but it's hard to really nail this down what is best. Right. So 440 versus 432 hertz is like the amount of cycles per second that a, a vibration has got. So oscillations per second, you could say. And I'll, I, again, it's one of those things that maybe half or more of the audience knows or maybe not. But some people might not know that at, at one point, music was always tuned to 432. 
per, uh, cycles per second for the, I believe, the A string. Is that right? That's at 432? Yeah, that's 432. No, it's 432. That's all. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, all the notes are sort of harmonics of or octaves of that uh, 432. Yeah. And well, it's a it got grid that you move. 440 by like mainstream, um, mainstream media, for lack of better words, that became like the standard. And it might not sound like a big difference, but eight cycles per second could have an influence on your biology. The 432 is supposed to be tied to the Earth's baseline frequency, like to nature frequency. Hmm. I know that uh, a lot of instruments, like native instruments, are tuned to 432. I think it's just when. It's, I don't think it's a coincidence that that is where I fall when I tune it by, by hearing, you know, for the most part. It's not that I listen. I don't listen to music much at all, actually. But so I can, that was an experiment I did because I, I wanted to shut out all the influence from all music and just make my own. So I have control over that too. So that's where the experiment with this, I sent you, on private message, I think I did, but <laughs> this earth music, I just go with this scaling, like, a, um, I, I used the, I don't know how I calculated it, but it's a long time ago, but it's, it, it's based on this, um, Fibonacci where I had like big cogs. I think there's so many sounds in there just in 432. I just wanted to blast me through every possible sound, you know, in that frequency because you have to kind of choose a frequency. Otherwise, it just sounds really bad. But So that thing you sent me, the inner mosaic, is, mm. uh, that's, that's actually your own creation. Yeah. That's so cool. I was listening to that all morning <laughs> before no. we talked. That's great. Oh, I did that. Do you mind if I share that in the show link? Like yeah, the sure. links on the show? people can see something you've made that is really interesting and related to this sound frequency thing. They might find it also in some way uh, interesting or energizing. I liked it a lot. I skipped coffee this morning and just had some lighter tea. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that did, did to me. I ran that for like a couple of weeks and I don't know what happened, but I felt it, it was a positive change. You know, I just quit using and uh, listen to radio or anything just just as, a, as an experiment you know and after that i didn't need to go around listen to music anymore so you ha you say in the description that it starts under the influence of sagittarius and ends in capricorn yeah so you're I was like into that you're encoding into sort that. of a astro theology almost like a druidic like a star path here yeah that was the, it's, it's like a season, a full earth cycle. I have the, the more windy periods and I have a little bit of rain and it's go to summer. And I tried to put that feeling into it with the different soundtracks also. I, I didn't, I put it very low there, but if you think about it, it's there. I don't know. It was supposed to become like this full feeling. I think it's like 60 tracks. You know, it's a huge project, that one. Yeah, that's why I want to share it with people. Clearly, that was a lot of your energy that went into it and high intentions, for sure. I well, think it was it supposed to be like... <laughs> it's for you only. <laughs> yeah, but if you want to share, it's no problem. You know, people can think whatever they think. You know, I remember sending this to one of my friends and, you know, he he wanted this more relaxed. This is more emotion. You know, it's supposed to be a more uh, awakening thing, not uh, uh, something you go to sleep over, just to point that out. No, but I think if you put headphones on and you sort of meditated with it, even the fact that it's got some like energetic aspects to it, it could mm -hmm. probably take you on a cool journey in your mind, in, in yourself. That's what the, the purpose was to like kickstart. That's awesome. Very awesome. <laughs> well, let's wrap up this first hour here, take our, our break, but of course, give any, any thoughts that you have left hanging out for the people that are on the, the free version of the show that and of course you guys are missing out if you don't stick around for the second hour by signing up at patreon which is patreon.com slash interverse second hour of this conversation and the second hour of all the conversations i do and they're always more interesting deeper more mystical weirder because you know we're all warmed up from talking for an hour uh but jock if you've got any 
contact information you want to share, or if you just would like people to talk to you, maybe through the Interverse Discord, or if there's anything that you want to point people towards, you know, wrap wrap it up for us and we'll move on to our break. Well, you know, I, I don't have my own like channel, but I'm going to say that I'm going to, at some point in the future, I'm going to make a big boom on YouTube and other platforms with a lot of videos that I've been working on for years. So at some point in the future, maybe, but I just want to thank you, Chance, you giving the opportunity to talk like this, you know, uh, you greet me with such, you know, grace. And I felt so welcome, you know, and when you started this universe, um, chat on discord, I think that was a brilliant idea that you did that. So people could connect and share stuff and because that broadened a lot of networks, you know, you gather in people that are like-minded or at least are curious, curious about stuff. You don't need to like everything, but just to have a, a platform where you can sort of also, you know, uh, if it grow too large, you get lost in the ocean also, you know? So yeah, with great thanks to you, media, you can get distracted so easily by other stuff, like a Facebook group, trying to talk to people to do that. You have all of the rest of Facebook to try to draw your attention away. But the discord chat for interverse is very focused and kind of organized. And right now it's not too big, <laughs> but even no. if it, even if it did get really big, there's ways that we can part, compartmentalize in a good way and all that. But yeah, it's awesome, man. I'm, I appreciate you, man. It's been great to become friends. And I'm sure we have a lot of fascinating conversations in our future, both recorded and not. So thanks for being here. And I'm looking forward to the second hour where we get into the, the really weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Chance. It's all, it's all on your, you know, all... all. I wouldn't be here talking if it wasn't for you, your effort to, you know, it's a hard thing to go out like this and put your face on something. Thank you, Chance. Oh, thanks, man. Chucks. All right. Well, see you guys <laughs> in the second hour, everyone. Thanks for joining us. All right, guys. Well, how'd you like that one? Had a lot of fun myself. I've been wanting to talk to Jock, talk to Jock <laughs> for a long time, actually. We mentioned that we became aware of each other because we've both done interviews on Unslaved, which is Michael Tessarian's podcast. That show comes up a lot lately. Probably worth checking out if you haven't yet. If you do check it out, you'll see some interviews I did where things got quite deep and interesting and in some subject matter that I'm personally very fascinated by, which is you know, Gnosticism, simulation theory, video games, psychology, all kinds of deep stuff. And Jock has a couple of episodes with them as well, where they talk about the box saga, which is kind of what the second hour of this episode was about. So if you didn't catch the second hour, I will try to explain it a little bit. We, I mean, it's impossible to go over it in a full summary detail in one hour, but the box saga is this oral tradition that was passed on supposedly from family member to family member all the way down to, I believe in the fifties or sixties, maybe when this dude Eeyore Bach would have received the information from his mother. And it's like the idea of the old oral history that would have been the way humans transmitted information before the age of written text. Now, I have, I wouldn't say I have a problem with the box saga in that it's not necessarily verifiable, but I wouldn't ask anyone to believe it. That's kind of where I'm at with it. I think it's really interesting. I think that if it is even somewhat true, it's going to fill a lot of holes in our historical narrative. It's going to give us a very different picture of the world than the one that was crafted for us by the monks and priests of the Vatican. Which, by the way, if you do start looking into history and alternative chronology, you're going to find that that's pretty much the the main source that we get a lot of stuff that's taken for granted, taken as gospel, taken as dogma. All goes back to the Vatican. So while I can't say that the box saga is verifiably true, there's a lot of controversial stuff in it as well. I don't. I neither support any of the ideas that supposedly our ancestors were into 
nor do I reject them. I just think it's an interesting conversation piece, and it is worth looking into. What got me intrigued about it was the fact that multiple researchers who I respect because their other research is so good have taken some time to present the information themselves. And you can find a lot of cool uh, box saga documentaries on YouTube. There's a book. I'll go ahead and link stuff like that in the show notes in case anyone wants to look into it for their self. But we didn't cover it in the plus extension as an overall like narrative we talked about different elements of it that I found interesting, that I found positive or cool. And, you know, we talked about some other stuff too, but I'm kind of over the uh, old way I used to do things where I would give you like this entire summary breakdown of everything that was in the plus extension. You're going to have to listen to it to find out. Box Sog is in there though. <laughs> so if that sounds neat. Then get over there. Or if you just want to support what I'm doing on Interverse, which would be pretty awesome if you did want to support it, you can do that patreon.com slash interverse you sign up for five bucks a month and there you go you got instant access to all of the archive of double length shows and a couple of exclusive shows and other patron only pieces of content and yeah that's really the only way that i get any support for what i'm doing here so if you think that maybe it's worth it <laughs> Five bucks isn't that much. I know some of us are in more strict financial situations than others, but a lot of us have got at least five bucks. And even if you didn't want to stay signed up for more than a month, you don't have to. Although maybe I shouldn't put that idea in your head. I would love it if you could be a recurring supporter of the podcast because I put so much energy into it. And yet I actually want to put more energy into it. I'm simply restricted by the fact that I currently need to have a different job to make ends meet and eat food that's not poisonous and all the other things, uh, take care of my pets and uh, my family. So I'd love it if you could help me make more content. That's really, at the end of the day, it's not about, you know, helping me get free of a job that I don't care for that much. Supporting Interverse is about supporting more of my research, making it to the internet because I've got a voracious appetite for knowledge, <laughs> if I do say so myself. I read a lot of books. I do a lot of studying and I have a lot that I could be sharing with the world that as a host of a show, I'm not exactly in the position to share on a research level. So I'd like to be, if you did catch me on the Unslaved podcast, that's actually kind of what I did there was present some original research. You know, if you guys were supporting me in a large enough amount that I could step away from the other types of work I have to do. I could be writing a book. I could be, I could be doing all kinds of things. Definitely making more videos though. I mean, I kind of want to make an entire second YouTube channel just to do videos that analyze video games and uh, certain other elements of pop culture, TV and movies, but we'll see. We'll get there. I have to remind myself I'm pretty young and I will eventually have the support and the framework in my life one way or the other, however I need to go about building it so that I can create all the stuff I want to create. And of course, there's always that fact that time is an issue and no one can actually do everything that they want to do. And we have to accept that. But for now, I'm a little bit limited to mostly just making the show as it is now. I have trimmed some aspects of it down so that I'm spending less time on parts of the work that I used to do that were maybe redundant or <laughs> Have you ever heard of the idea of perf uh, perfectionist procrastinating, where you basically are procrastinating by being a perfectionist, if that makes sense, spending too much time on pointless little aspects of polish or details that don't really matter and keeping yourself from doing other things that do matter? I definitely fall into that trap a lot. So, it, you know, maybe there'll be a happy medium pretty soon where I kind of swing back towards the middle and spend a little bit more time on the polishing aspect of the interviews. But to be honest, I'm kind of in a pickle because the recording software that I've been using all this time has changed in some way, and I can't get the same high-quality audio for, at least on my side, and divide the the uh, audio between the guest and myself in quite the same way where you'd be able to hear it more clearly. So if that's a problem right now, I'm sorry, but give me a couple months. I'll save up a little bit of the money or as much of the money as I can that's coming in from you patrons. And I'll put it towards getting a new podcast recording software system that will 
make everything much clearer and much better. And maybe even let me start doing live stream stuff more easily. All of these things and more could be yours. It <laughs> could be possible if you cared enough to support the podcast with a very meager $5 a month. But there's also higher tiers of contribution you can make that have some other neat rewards. Like if you go up to the $12 range and a few of you do that, then we'll start doing some monthly uh, $12 patron exclusive podcast chats where we can even put those out for the plus community to listen to and you know, it could be like Q&A, it could just be a hangout, but whatever. I'd love to start doing that. So if you want to collab with me and make some podcasts that are more like conversational, hanging out, or you, you pick the topics, you, you know, I'm just going to be there for you and we'll record together. Just jump on Patreon and bump up your subscription to the $12 amount. And that would be awesome. Also at $50, which I know is huge, I will send you a t-shirt and I will uh, send you posters and stuff after that. I know that a t-shirt for $50 seems extreme, but it's not really like you're buying a t-shirt for $50. It's like you think that you want to support the podcast with that much energy, maybe just for one month, and I will gift you a t-shirt in return. It's kind of a sweet deal. And so that's all possible. Uh, and, you know, maybe more rewards in the future for Patreon, but I'm trying not to make it too big and unmanageable. <laughs> so enough about the Patreon stuff. Um, Jock is awesome. Definitely excited for the future of knowing that guy and being friends with him. Appreciate him coming on the show. Like I said at the beginning, I hope you also enjoyed his awesome accent and the uh, different perspective on knowledge that he brought to the table. In our Discord chat for Interverse, we have this uh, Discord server. Jock has been really, really helpful in decoding different things that he has a historical knowledge about. And you can find the Discord probably linked in the show notes unless I forget. Just kidding. I won't forget. Also at the InterversePodcast.com website, you can find a link to Discord. It's a chat server platform. You can get an app on your phone or you can do it through a computer. And it's like social media, but that's just for Interverse, which makes it awesome. You don't have distracting other things going on. Like if you were trying to communicate in a Facebook group, it's a lot more real time and fun and Great people in there already, and I'd love to have more of you join us. And I'm going to wind my way towards the wrap up here, but <laughs> before I do, uh, I'm going to get myself in a little more trouble and address some of the pot stirring I've been doing. I tend to, over the course of the last couple of years, especially avoid Facebook and do really not a lot with it other than promote my show. But the problem with that is if all I'm doing is posting my content like once a week and not engaging with people and talking with people and making frequent other posts, the algorithm just buries that and it's like non-existent and no one finds it anyway. So uh, the other option would be to get a little more engaged and communicate it, communicate with people through Facebook, which is brutal. It's super brutal. And as you probably know from the fact that we did an episode with Matt Landman a couple of weeks ago, I'm not super hip to the whole mask thing or the totalitarian takeover that's being done in the name of this invisible thing that is going to kill grandma if we don't cover our faces. That being said, uh, and I'm trying not to say certain words because that might, even that might cause like YouTube censorship, but I have compassion for people. It may seem like I'm, I guess, cold online. I got myself in trouble by making posts or rants about this, that, or the other thing. And, uh, you know, the, the bees come and swarm at you and people that are your friends will kind of try to show you up or slam dunk on your posts and tell you why you're wrong because science and that's fine. You know, that's all fine. Do what you think you got to do out there. But the main point I've been trying to get across by, uh, talking about this issue online <laughs> is that there's a serious divide and conquer strategy. It's as old as can be, and it's been repeated throughout history, which is that you put out contradictory information and make contradictory information available and keep it flowing day after day. So like one day the CDC or the World Health Organization says masks do work. The next day they say they don't work. And then one day they say death rates are soaring. The next day they say, actually, it's not so bad. 
And it's really classic. It's divide and conquer because a bunch of people will have information that they think is right because they got it from the official sources, from the authority. And it turns out that then the next day someone else gets different information and then they fight over it. And we're all at each other's throats about this petty stuff when the fact is there's like real uh, weird New World Order type agendas going on, like the elimination of physical currency or uh, <laughs> defunding the police. And as an anarchist, I'm cool with getting rid of police. But as a realist, I see the way that this is being done is not the way that an enlightened society would be going about it. And even, you know, the idea of police, I'm not like anti heroes, right? I think that in an anarchy type society, you could have a form of social harm harmony and, and such that there could be people out there who in a non authoritarian capacity are just in some way employed or um, contracted, if you will, to watch out for others and help, defend the peace and all that. That's cool. Anyway, I'm getting into weird territory with this rant. My point is, um, actually, the thing that I was most uh, butthurt and offended about was I wound up finding, I don't go there very often and I hadn't checked back for a long time, but I went to the iTunes podcast app to see if, what the reviews were like for the show and see if there's any cool new reviews that maybe I could share. And I found this super long rant where someone gave me three stars and essentially it's like, I've been listening to your show for a year or something and I don't like how you're talking about conspiracy stuff and fear mongering and all that. So I'm not going to respond to that in full other than to just say, guys, if you do have a problem or feedback that you want to give me about this show, it'd be a lot cooler of you to just message me or email me or something talk to me like I'm a human being rather than go and try to like punish me with a a shitty review on the internet that's now up there permanently and will taint people's opinion that might be finding the show for the first time. Like I don't care about having a perfect five-star review record. If someone goes and does that, whatever. But the fact is if, if you have been following the show for that long, like this person claims to have been, you should know that uh, first of all, I'm a human being, so I'm not always going to be like the most perfect, positive person, although I try. And second of all, you should know my goal was never to scare anybody. It was actually just to find the truth, get to the bottom of the truth. And it's also not my responsibility to represent both sides of an argument perfectly, especially when one side of the argument is censored and stifled, which I want to look at. And the other side is the mainstream version of the argument. Why would why would you even be coming here to listen to the show if the uh, if I'm making entire episodes where I, I inquire into the mainstream version of an argument that you can get literally everywhere else? And to go back to my original point, the mainstream version of any particular polarized subject is constantly shifting anyway to keep people thrown off balance and off of their guard. So anyway, probably didn't need to go into all that, but... Felt good to get it off my chest. Hope you guys still like me. (laughs) Well, I like you, and I appreciate that you're even this deep into a show and listening to my outro. I mean, probably a lot of people don't even make it that far. Um, On a good news level, I just finished an awesome book called Tuning the Human Biofield by Eileen Day McCusick. I would look that up, Tuning the Human Biofield. I'm pretty stoked on it. I'm going to be experimenting with tuning forks, which is what that book was about. Maybe even having her on the show someday. If we're lucky, cross your fingers. Maybe drop her a message on social media if you know who I'm talking about and say, hey, you should go on Interverse. That'd be cool of you to do that. And otherwise, like I kind of said in that rant a minute ago, if you got feedback or concerns or just want to say, hey, I am trying to be available and I'm enjoying the community interaction that I get. Sometimes it's a lot, but it's not too much yet. (laughs) And... It's always good. All good people uh, uh, that have ever contacted me from my work on this show. And I'd love to hear from you. You can email me, chance at interversepodcast.com. You can find me on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, probably some other places. Drop a comment on YouTube, whatever. You're smart. You can find me. (laughs) I'm out there. And best of all, there's that Discord chat that you can get on. But now we're running pretty long on this outro. I better wrap it up. I have... 
excellent interviews coming up for the next several weeks. Can't wait to deliver some of those shows. Sometimes I just want to hit the fast forward button on life and be there in those conversations already and getting them out to you. But we'll get there. And the last thing to remind you of, because I've already told you about Patreon, but there would be more content more frequently if I had more supporters. That's just the way it is. I hope that we can make that happen. Hope that you can make that happen. But I'm stoked that you're checking it out anyway, even if you're a free person. Get on the Discord and chat with us. That'd be cool. And I'm going to play us out with a track I discovered. It's not a super new track, a couple years old, but it's by Atia. Uh, and I will put the link to that song in the show notes. Don't have it up in front of me right now, so I can't tell you what the song is called. But if you're watching the video, it'll tell you. And it's also in the show notes. So always fun to play some cool music at the end of a show. I like to do that. And I'm going to do it now. And I'm going to get off of here. And thanks for tuning in. You guys be good out there. Much love.
holding me.